try this one more time. What is up, Shark Nation? Luke Curry here, your uh, your usual host here on the podcast. Uh, this is the, the second time we tried to get this going with some technical difficulties, but we're here now. Um, as usual, uh, Mark Baker is out there in Glen Aguirre, uh, but we've got our, our guest here today, Connell O'Mora. And how are you doing, Connell? I am exceptionally well. Thank you very much. You're very welcome here to the Shark Pod. Uh, the, 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 the thing that we wanted to have a chat with you today about is, me, me and Mark were actually talking about this um, earlier on, how to kind of frame this conversation. And maybe just to give the, the listeners uh, a background of, of the type of uh, career that you've had. I would say that you're like a broadcaster in the last, say, 20 years, but also um, also an entrepreneur with the media group. Uh, you worked for RT. You were a stockbroker for a while as well, and also a Goyle School uh, organizer as your first job. So there's a there's a lot to cover there. Uh, what, how would you describe what, what you are today? Kind of uh, media curious, I suppose, is the best way of putting it. Is if there's anything at all in media that I can get involved in, I'm terribly, terribly interested in it. And bits of pieces that you may not know about me is that it kind of runs in the family. My dad, who is no longer with us, he was chairman in RTE. He had a newspaper. My granddad, who was a most unusual collection of a Presbyterian Gilgior, he had his own uh, newspaper as well. So then I bought uh, or I set up a, a newspaper down in Athlone at one stage, the Athlone Voice. I had a newspaper in UCD called Gobshout. That was one of my, my better enterprises where um, myself and a few other pals used to put together basically a cost of mag and I made an awful lot of money relative when I was in third year I think in college and I made an awful lot of money out of that so that was a lot of fun and um, maybe and was, <laughs> it's a pity that... you keep that up. And and was was the was the gossip bag was that like a uh, for like famous people or just people around the college or what was that? Well, just college, just college. So you know, I'd say uh, we saw Luke and Mary yesterday. Now Luke may not have ever even heard of Mary, but Luke had to buy the newspaper. This is back in the days of a newspaper, and Mary had to buy it. And Mary's pals and Luke's pals now have a laugh. And so long as I didn't libel them, and we didn't end up in court, but it was always very, very close to the bone. I'm um, being circumspect exactly on what we used to say about people, but um, it was obviously there were lots of inferences always about everything. It was it was complete um, made up stuff, really. But it so exceptionally well. There were 10,000, I think, students in UCD back then. And within two hours, we sold 2,000 copies uh, of a newspaper or a magazine. And um, at 50 old pence each, plus advertising. Oh. You can do the maths. It was wow. very, very lucrative. And when you, when you, so I know we're, we're kind of jumping around here, but when you started that, was, was that something in your head going, okay, this is where I'm going to make my fortune now? If, if I'm, if I'm getting twenty percent of the of the population uh, to buy this, we just magnify that. Just something that I wanted to do because there's, there are many, many, many things I wanted to do. Uh, I was also the previous year I was the students' union president, uh, which is a full time role in UCD, and that kind of gave me a taste for things. And there were some old scores I had to settle. <laughs> and the best thing was to put them into print. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I do a lot of things just for the fun of it, because um, some of the things were not that lucrative, unfortunately. But they involved media, and once it involves media, I mean, uh, I tried to buy, um, not buy, I pitched for the national radio license, uh, the one that was given to... Um, century back in a hundred years ago and I also pitched for a local Dublin radio license as well uh, with a lot of my colleagues from RTE and what we were going to basically do there was take what I thought was the best better people in that RTE bring them out and put them into another radio station and um, since RTE Radio 1 had the audience still has the audience if there was a second one which looked very like it with the same people Richard Crowley for example was involved with me um, I thought it would make a lot of sense that uh, we just, you know, yourself, 20% of uh, a very large market is still a very large market. Uh, we weren't going to reinvent any wheel. And if you remember, Century went pop. We didn't get the license, so um, I wasted money and time on that one. But you always have to try those things. Otherwise, you'll never find out. 
So, and was that straight after college or was that, was that kind of later on in your career? When you got that, done? No, that was later on. That was when I was stockbroking. So I spent eight years in RTE. I had a fabulous time there. I loved There's a guy, uh, you're based in uh, Greystones. There's a lovely man down in Greystones called Peter McNiff, who was my first boss. And he taught me like no other, uh, very much into the deep end. One day, I was, we were preparing, we, we, we used to do with television, I used to, I was involved with a TV program called Countrywide, huge audiences, I think, bef- uh, except for the nine o'clock news, which was the absolute mainstay, this is back during the Northern Ireland Troubles time, so a lot of people were, you know, absolutely smitten by watching TV news and seeing the new awful things that had happened. The other, the second most popular show was Countrywide, which was news from around the country um, on RTE. And uh, Peter McNiff being my boss, we were just given free reign to go find interesting stories and do them away. But one day he phoned in, he said he couldn't make it in and that I was going live into studio, uh, live, live TV. And that is a daunting prospect. It was, I love it now. And uh, I learned one huge lesson on that first night that I was on. You'll understand from even from this podcast that you have a fair idea how many questions you need prepared for, say, an hour. Well, all I had to do was three minutes. And I had 13 questions prepared on live TV. Can't remember what the subject was, but I ran out of questions. <laughs> That is not a very nice feeling. <laughs> and afterwards, it was as plain as plain to anybody who knew what was going on, that it was a bit of a disaster in front of the camera. And uh, afterwards, I remember Peter rang me back, old-fashioned phone, hello, Peter here, how are you? And all he said to me was, you'll never do that again. And Did how he, right he was. You won't was do it again? Or? fantastic <laughs> lesson. You won't do it again in the sense that next time you'll do it better. Okay. That's what you learn. All, all that kind of stuff that you learn in uh, you know MBAs and MBSs and MBA everything else is, is uh, you learn from those experiences. And my good God, I have never in many, many, many years of broadcast since never had that problem because I wouldn't let it happen again. I know what was wrong. I asked questions where the answer was yes or no. Simple, simple um, lesson to anybody listening who wants to get on in broadcasting. Never ask a question where the answer is yes or no. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Like I was just on a, on a call earlier on trying to, I was coaching one of my friends to, uh, for a, an interview, uh, like a role play interview for a sales job. Um, and in the place where I work and I was saying to him when we were running through it he, there was a few questions there where the, it was a one word answer and you know it's going to be a one word answer so never ask those answers because that doesn't get, or ask those questions because those don't uh, open up anybody they'll just give you exactly what you asked for it's very uh, very simple so and that's why we have these <laughs> these types of questions on the podcast where it's like what do you think about that that could be that could be a half an hour where the person it certainly thought, could anything that has an emotion or how do you feel about or yep yep yeah, absolutely. So, listen, how do you feel about uh, podcasting? Is that, uh... <laughs> it's a very, actually, a really interesting question, and I'll tell you why. Because I've obviously, what, what happened, for those of you who uh, don't know what I've been doing for a few years, I was for 13 years on the Sunday Business Show on Today FM, and we did, and I always said this, we did business differently. Why? I prefer the way we do business rather than other people do business we're not um we we don't want to catch people out i love the nutty people who go into business they're my absolute go-to's i you have to be crazy i call them the misfits you have to be a misfit to go into business on your own and what i always want to know is just about their journey or how they got there what they're going to do what they dream of how difficult it is etc so Two years ago, in its wisdom, Today FM decided that it was uh, no longer, what was it? They used some term like, we, we didn't fit into their um, formula or form, format or whatever. So they took us off, which is a bit silly because we had 90,000 listeners and we were the most listened to show on a Sunday. Fine, that's a commercial decision on their part. So I hadn't taken off, it was a Sunday, it was live, and I hadn't taken off a Sunday 
in 13 years. And what that means as well is I didn't take a holiday that was longer than six days in 13 years. And that just comes down to basic paranoia. <laughs> I loved, I really loved that show so much. And I really, I had actually, I had one guy once came in, Brian O'Donovan, who is now RTU's man in, um, in uh, Washington. Such a lovely gentleman. And Brian, I, I, something big happened and I needed somebody in a hurry. And Brian was, may have been working in news talk at the time anyway, so he popped in and uh, covered for me. But anyway, so after two, 13 years, I took six months off. I, was, like a, I actually went on a holiday or two. And then I started plotting as to how I could get back into broadcast. And I'm going to answer your podcast question in a second now. And I couldn't really find a way to find an audience because that's the difficulty, finding an audience. When you have a radio station, there is a ready-made audience for you. When you guys started out, when I started out, you start with nobody, zero people listening. Now, fortunately, things have been kind to us, so we built it up rather rapidly. But podcasting is a work in progress for all of us because nobody knows where it's going to go to. My, I hope it's my informed belief is, and I think you'll, I hope you'll agree with me on this. I think it's curtains for what we call old fashioned radio. I have kids who are in their 20s. I doubt if they know where the on or off button is on the radio. And I'll go further. I don't doubt if they even know when or where, sorry, where the radio is in this house. They don't use radio. They use Spotify. They use any of their apps. They're not listening to radio. And that's where I say, and I, like, I, I don't like saying this because a lot of my friends work in music radio. I can't see a future for it. Who is going to listen to the top 10, top 100 when you can listen to it yourself? You can make it up yourself. And then Spotify, if you like such and such a song or such and such a, such and such a genre, Spotify will give you another 100 or 1,000 of those types of music. And I just can't. I, I, I'm Willie O'Reilly, my former boss in Today FM, who does know a lot about radio, he completely disagrees with me about this. And I just don't see where it's going to go. And I do, I mean, this is uh, anybody who follows me on LinkedIn will see that I frequently put up postings of the Jen Allores, the uh, listener um, ratings. I just don't believe them. I'm sure they're put up there by very well-meaning people, but frankly, I do not believe them. I think that podcasting will be it, but the problem with podcasting is for anybody anywhere, there are, I think, now one million plus podcasts. Where do you find it? How do you find it? And that's why, again, for those listening who don't know what I'm now doing, and I have to fill in the little gap there, is, uh, and I'll get to that in a second, we started that great business show uh, with Zero, and Jamie Heaslip, a rather well-known uh, rugby player, uh, is part of the Conquer the World uh, thinking here. He's got 600,000 followers on social media. And he, I'm delighted to say Jamie, had been on the radio program with me twice. And I got on very well with him. And by complete chance, I had done nothing to do with this. Uh, he came to me and he said he wanted to get into podcasting. Would I have a chat? And a penny, a very big penny, dropped with me that he and I could do a business podcast because he is an engineer, entrepreneur, investor, business coach, and he, he tips so many things, and he was just ideal. And I'm now on, we're now on episode eight. To, this week would be episode nine. You're episode 50. We've got some catching up to do. And it's just going from strength to strength. He is brilliant to work with. So what I had done just for that, to fill in that gap, there were two years, and I just was messing around thinking of how best to do it. Because the challenge for you guys, 
challenge for me and the challenge for everybody else in podcasting is to stand out and to be found. And the amount of work we're putting into uh, social media and into your own area there, Luke, uh, um, the, the, the whole CRM, customer relationship management, uh, you're familiar with through HubSpot, is that's where it's at. You have to engage almost on a one-on-one with a mass audience. That takes an awful lot of work and a lot of time. But it's back. It's good fun because you're back to the people. The people who now tune in, they're dedicated. They love you. We love them. And they are what we now call Team GPS, Great Business Show. And the reason we call it that Great Business Show, and I hope both of you will laugh at this because if you don't, I won't be happy, is we call it that Great Business Show because every guest has to say, I was on that Great Business Show. Which Great Business Show? That Great Business Show. Ho, 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 ho. So they have to kind of repeat it and then uh, get our message across there about what we are, about who we are. So that's uh, how I got into podcasting. Um, I've been involved. Uh, I still broadcast Asquelge on Radio Gertrude, on News Talk for Splunk, on, uh, in English on Business Matters. I do stuff for BBC Northern Ireland. So I have all of that interest. I also have my own uh, PR company, uh, and I'm always looking. I have a, uh, uh, I've got two, I suppose, big projects that I want to get across the line about, um, uh, particularly about uh, the, the funding of the 1921-22 revolution. I found a piece of information that I cannot share with you because otherwise I'd have to go and kill you. But I want to make a TV one-hour special, or even I might even make a movie of it as to. The person, I think I found a person, one person who put a massive amount of money into paying for our revolution 100 years ago. And I found it by complete chance. And I'd love that as a project. I have so many projects. I love cars and I want to make a TV series about cars, but in a very, very different way. I detest, I loathe um, the, what do you call it, uh, James May and uh, uh, Top Gear. That program. The Top Gear. That's not about cars, it's about their egos. I want to, I can sit, sad man that I am, and look at a car. Just look at a car. When I was a little, little boy, I used to go around, I was born and bred in Black Rock in South Dublin. Uh, I used to go around to the local um, car garages and get all of their uh, sales brochures. And to this day, I can put my hand about one foot away from me here into a box and I can pull out sales brochures for Mercedes, Rover, Minis, everything. I'm a slightly odd person for that kind of stuff. (laughs) It must be be, um, exhausting being that interested in so many different things, being that inquisitive, Connell. That's only the beginning. I mean, I'm just... I am curious about a lot of things. And um, I noticed that about, I met Jamie before. He's a great guy, but he's very, he's the same. He's very passionate about different things. He's very inquisitive, which makes for a great team, a great business podcast for sure. That great business well, podcast even. Oh, thank you so much. You see the way you said that? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and yeah, he is, as I say again, he's fantastic to work with. And I learn, I was never going to be, and actually we were laughing last week, he is a top class, an elite athlete, he was a lion, etc. So you can't get any better uh, uh, at being an athlete than he is or was. I was the other end of the spectrum. Uh, I was in school and I was that guy that nobody wanted to choose uh, on the, for, for a team. I was the last guy chosen. I didn't really care because what I would do is I would chat to people on the pitch and or if I had to do anything else. Actually, when I was in UCD, they put me into goal. Now, I'm not talking about the first team. I'm talking about the Z team. If there was a Z minus one, that was probably me. And they, they put me in goal and they called me the windmill. Do you know why? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's all I did. It was so sad. And I can't say, I'm not over enthused. I will definitely watch uh, uh, Leinster Rugby, but I watch it more for the human interaction. I wouldn't know 
and I was saying this just to, to Jimmy the other day, is that he talks about, you know, popping a loop. That's a different language. I don't even know what he's talking about. Uh, a pop pass means nothing. I never, ever played a game of rugby in my life. So I find his interest and he just comes at the world in a completely different way. I look at a movie and I was trained in TV by RT. Thank you very much. And when I'm looking at a movie, I bore people because they say, you know, that was a very bad cut. Or do you see, do you hear this drop off in sound there? That's what I'm doing with movies. Yeah. I love movies. Uh, I love music. Yeah. I love I opera. With, uh, when, when I'm uh, doing the, um, when I'm doing the, the, the you know, the, the back end of the podcast, when I listen to podcasts now, I can hear where there was rough cuts or things were cut out or, and I yeah. it's very obvious to me. And I'm like, that's a, that's a really sloppy job, you know, but uh, <laughs> and I think the, the interesting about the Jamie as well is it, it, as of all of the Irish, um, uh, Irish athletes, the, the kind of the, the big names in sport and stuff like that. One of the things is like, what, what do you do next after, after sport kind of ends? A lot of the people kind of coast on the, uh, on their name or, you know, they do some commentating and stuff like that. But it seemed like even before Jamie was actually out of the sport, he was kind of, uh, well known for the business side of things as well. Do you know what I mean? Like it was always. He's got the smart, and it being smart, which he is, he was thinking ahead. Like anybody will tell you, doing some commentary, that ain't going to keep the wolf from the door, and you've got to have a real business plan in front of you. So he's got the two bars, and he's got. Uh, various investments and he's got his um, his consultancy and he's got his coaching and 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 I, I mean chatting to him there is brand Jamie Heaslip and I know what he's going to do with it and I know he's going to be hugely successful with it and I hope he brings it international because anybody who comes on to that great business show we always want them to be thinking of get, about getting off the island as we repeat too often maybe six million people on the island of Ireland eight billion people off the island of Ireland. So um, it doesn't take a genius to work out that all the businesses here should be thinking of uh, trying to get do something abroad. And that's another thing I'm trying to do is, um, I know, you keep reminding me of all these projects that I'm meant to be doing and I'm not getting around to because I'm spending too much time on the uh, uh, getting the, that great business show up. I want to do on the radio show we used to do uh, with my stockbroking background, a stocks and shares show. And that we changed that to uh, another idea altogether about stocks and shares. But I have a plan and I need a sponsor to go worldwide with a stocks and shares show, but done in a way that no, the, none of the other ones uh, are done. And I spent, I'm sure you guys do the same, an awful lot of time. Saturday, cleaning the house is my time to try to find any podcast that I would say, my God, that's a great idea. That's fabulous. That's brilliantly done. Very hard to find because I find the American way of doing it, of shouting at you and being overly enthusiastic, yeah. just doesn't do it for me. I find it's a cultural it's thing. Like, it's like How the... I built it has a massive following, massive. And I'd like to ask them, how do they build a following? It's one yeah. hour an hour and 10 minutes of a guy having a chat. It's very nice. But how can you build into, I can't remember, have they got a million followers or something? It is huge. More than that even. They're, they're huge. Like, But the, the what you said there about the stocks and shares and stuff like that, I don't think there's anything like that. Like we're, we yeah. had on the podcast last, uh... oh, can you hear me? Am I back? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, Connell, can you hear me? I can hear you again now. You did go off there for a second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I was saying that the Stocks and Shares podcast thing, there's nothing really out there like that. I, and we had somebody on the podcast last week, uh, Michael Houghton uh, from the Irish uh, Fire podcast. Uh, he's big into investing. He was teaching us all uh, about, you know, making sure that we look after our retirement, all that type of stuff. Um, but like we we're saying that I was looking for some content this, uh, this week about that. And all I got was um, that Kramer guy in America shouting, uh, about what to buy and stuff like that. And oh, I, don't really, I don't really trust him. Oh, he's terrible. Like, and he has made absolute millions out of that. It's uh, No, that's not my style at all. But I do, as I say, I have that, that idea. 
and it's completely doable. And what's nice is because, uh, like Monty Python said, what did the Romans ever do for us? What did the British ever do to, for us? They gave us the bear, like they gave us the English. And I would like to think that our command of the English is probably better than many, but we also know our stocks and shares as well as anybody in the US or in the UK. So mine, not mine, but I would like to chair an analysis. Say we were doing an analysis of McDonald's or Boeing or Mercedes or something. That analysis by guys from Davy or Good Body or one of those is as good as anything that you will find anywhere in the world. And that could be uh, podcasted never know about that word. It, uh, it could be broadcast by podcast uh, uh, to the world. And I'm well up for that. So that's uh, one of my many other podcasting ideas that I have to get across the line. They won't happen between now and Christmas, but next year I would like to have three, four other, say four total of four podcasts, <laughs> separate podcasts running. Wow, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of work uh, to keep those going. But um, what would you say? Just when you were talking there, I thought about this question here. So say like you've had a, a long career in both being uh, on, like you said, RTE uh, for international le- listeners. That's the national broadcaster here in Ireland. Um, we counted today forty three countries uh, tuning into the Shark Pod. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, I don't know, some people are listening out there in the Philippines, you're very welcome, but it's very uh, local content that we're giving there. But anyway, so uh, what, what would you say to somebody who are maybe leaving college, they love media like you, they, they might have worked at a school, their college newspaper or something, they want to be in media, would you say to them to get going with some sort of podcast or would you say, no, go get your training wheels, uh, try to get into internships, into RT, into Irish Times, or, you know, what, what do you think uh, you'd say to people like that? That's really interesting because I like to work a lot. I don't really take holidays, as I mentioned. So my working day would be maybe 6 a.m. until 11 p.m. And I'm not making a martyr. It just so happens that I love absolutely everything I do. And we had on that great business show last weekend or last week a positive psychologist, Professor Dr. Joe Burke, Joe Lanter Burke from uh, NUI Maynooth. And she, I asked her that very question about me because she was telling us that we have to have downtime. And I said, but my downtime is working. And she said, well, if it works for you, that's great. It doesn't work for everybody else. And I said, that's fine. To answer your question, if I was a young person, man or woman, uh, leaving college or school, I would say, get into any media you can make the tea you make the coffee sweep the floor the usual thing there but also get into podcasting and also make little movies and also learn uh, I mean, everything you can learn online nowadays get into photography learn about framing if you learn about framing with stills photography you'll then learn about camera work once you learn camera work, you then go off and start making mini movies. Once you start making mini movies, you become a, bl- a vlogger, blogger, podcaster, whatever you want to be. There's nothing stopping anybody from being all of the above. And then using so much clever software, you can then post all of it and you can become kind of famous now it's not famous for the sake of being famous, but it's famous in some fashion to make a living as in somebody will pay you to do some work and that is when you make the breakthrough there's uh, it's pretty difficult to try to get into the irish times or rte nowadays but that said there are always opportunities in particular they do and i as an employer would also look at this i would look at people who say i want to come and work with you if anybody is listening to this um, podcast and who wants to work, I am actually running, looking for what is called a runner or a greeter for that great business show, a person who will be at the most fundamental level, just learning to put a podcast or actually what we use, uh, the Dublin South FM uh, radio studios for our podcast. So they see a proper radio studio in action, how it moves, They can get the benefit of my couple of years experience (laughs) and I take no prisoners. I explain it to people and then we get on with it and we get it done quickly 
and uh, so there's an opportunity. There you go now. How many people have uh, put a, a job offer up onto the Shark Pod podcast? <laughs> not many, not many. Uh, you're the but first. I didn't, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say I was going to pay them. This is an internship. I need you for a Thursday afternoon for about two hours. I was going to put it up on my re recruitment website, Connell. I, I won't be doing it now. I won't get paid. <laughs> cool. Okay, so that, that's kind of interesting as well. You're saying that it, what what I got from that um, that that uh, answer is the guys are there's nothing stopping people from putting uh, content out there now, which I think is a, an incredible thing. So there's going to be people who are consumers and people who are producers, right? So if you're producing uh, and you can have your own audience that's something that uh, employers can buy as well from you you know it's, it's your personal personal creative. brand like you should be creating your personal brand like this guy yeah. this guy i know that went uh he worked for hope's body i think he's moved on now but he, he was working in the, the the u.s office when i went there for training um and he had no uh, marketing background uh, as in uh he didn't go to university or anything like that but he had a million followers on uh on twitter so they said he can do whatever you want you'll figure it out <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. Now, where he found those million, that's a really good question because that is exceptionally difficult to build up that following. And you yeah. have to, I mean, that's a lot of work. Yeah, so that's that was the thing. So I'm saying that it's not just, uh, I don't think if, if people are, are, are thinking about and, uh, going to university or going uh, to college and getting top marks, I don't know if that's going to, it's not the selling point that it may may have been. Uh, in the past, if a lot of people have that same degree, um, especially nowadays when you can differentiate yourself, like you said, uh, start vlogging about what you're doing, making videos. Um, this is just for, well, not maybe not just for media, but this is something that if definitely if you're into media, you should be having uh, a huge portfolio of stuff. Uh, and it's fun to make as well. And it's what to, to, to podcast or to write about or to whatever about something you, uh, you are passionate about. And you guys know that if you're passionate about something and you call it work, but it's not really work, it's because you love it. I, as I mentioned earlier, have no interest in, uh, uh, actually, I, should, I should correct myself. Um, I did actually uh, tour the world with UCD soccer once upon a time. So, uh, but I was, a, I was a bag carrier, not, I never played. You were the uh, runner in this, in this case. <laughs> I was the runner. Exactly. And they brought me to Australia, India, Hong Kong, through Africa, blah, blah, blah. And uh, India, did I say that? Places that I would never have had the chance to see. But I just made myself useful and suddenly I was on those trips. Equally, if you make yourself useful, I mentioned those things about cars. If you're really, if you're truly passionate about a car, there's actually a guy called Doug Muro, M-U-R-O. If you haven't seen or heard him, he has the most gorgeous, simple uh, review of cars. He's an American. And he's like somebody's geeky big brother. But I could watch him forever because he, you can actually see that he's utterly honest, truthful, and he gives his really quirky way. And he's got a few little quirky things that he adds in. And I love that. Is We've added him to that great business show jamie's words of wisdom anything like that i just like twist the people latch on to and on doug muro he has doug's score or something like that and he gives a quirky score on each car that he finds and uh, that's a definite one for you guys to watch brilliant 40 40 minutes of your life i think each. like you can if you could pick a niche and it doesn't matter how niche it is and really go all in with it you can really get a big following online whether that's youtube or podcasts and but don't do what other people do. So if you choose sport, and nothing wrong with doing that, find a different way of doing sport that is not about a game of two halves, business end of the season, all those goddamn cliches. But find something weird and wonderful, a different way of doing it. When I was working with RTE, uh, they sent me out to the uh, Olympic Games once upon a time and we were given a little booklet and it gave me in that tiny little booklet the essence of every sport in the, uh, in the Olympics. And I just always think that anybody who's doing a sport, sports podcast misses out on that to add in essentials of every sport that just to remind people what it's about uh, 
got it through. Just don't assume that everybody knows as much as you do. If I'm ever talking about stocks and shares, I go mental when people start talking about PE ratios, words that ordinary people, normal people never use. All I want to know is that, is it well run? Is it worth buying? And what are the threats? Simple, ordinary language. And so, something that I found was very unique about that great business uh, show is the format. Very different to most podcasts and, and unique and obviously comes from your background. Is that something you put a lot of thought into? Um, and by that, you probably know what I mean. The way it's the way it's kind of professionally laid out and numer- I don't know how you have time to get three different, find three different guests for each, each four, show. Four. Four. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, is, uh, I suppose if I'm not doing it right after a hundred years of broadcast, now remember I was properly and fully trained over years in RTE and I am forever grateful to the people in the newsroom there who actually did train me and I hope trained me well and and then we had over the 13 years in Today FM we had a winning formula I mean 90,000 people listening to business because we didn't play any songs so they had to listen in just to business that wasn't bad and we that was forever tweaking our two lovely um uh, uh, producers who built up that audience. One woman called Myra Hayes, she's down in Cork and she's still producing down there. And Ruth Devaney, we still have, I mean, we're still team, this, we used to be team SBS. We we're still the same team. And uh, when I was starting the podcast, I went directly to them. They gave me such and such advice do this, do that, shorten it, lengthen it, whatever. And I would defer to them because they also know what they are doing. So, yeah, it works because. I hope that people are, never get bored because if you are, I mean, Mark, if I was doing an item about, say, HR, and if you were on, someone doesn't, doesn't, just doesn't want to hear that, but they want to hear about gin making or something, you can skip on. So you have to have that. We're doing deliberately two men, two women outside and inside of Dublin to get a gender and regional balance on every show. And that's, we, myself and Jamie decided that. So again, because if it was myself and Jamie, the amount of testosterone that was oozed out of the uh, studio wouldn't be, wouldn't be happy. So now with our two women minimum, it just bounces along much easier on the ear and it just softens it. And we had a lovely uh, Hannah Rickson of Get the Shifts on last week. And just her modulation of voice, because you said, uh, Nuke, that you know you're now listening to different podcasts and listening to the oral uh, satisfaction that you get, and it's so important. I listened. Who was I listening to the other day? And I said, God, full of great ideas, but what an awful voice! I won't say who it was, um, but I would choose people on their voice as well, just because it is. It's it's an entertainment. And if you have somebody screaming at you, we mentioned that lad Kramer earlier, that's not an entertainment. That's just a nuisance. It's an annoyance. So that is, um, we, we do try to, it's all boxed off segments. I try to do 15 minutes each, but I normally, because I love what they're talking about, we try to, we intend to ramble on to about 17 to 20 minutes. Probably at 20 minutes, it's going on a little bit too long. And that's, again, you learn, that's you're indulging yourself maybe, is that you've just got to cut back and leave the listener wanting that little bit more. Isn't that what you, they always say to you? That great entertainment is, is if, if a singer sang four, six hours, then you get really bored. But if they do 90 minutes, 90 really brilliant minutes, and then you call them back for an encore and they leave you after two hours, that is just the perfect mix. And Hollywood has given you that. Hollywood movies run 90 minutes because they work out scientifically, that is the optimum. And going almost full circle back to about podcasting, people are making 20 second, 20 minute podcast, 45 minute podcast, an hour and a half podcast. No, the jury is absolutely out on what is the right length. I think it depends on the subject matter. We were just talking about this earlier, Luke, you know, if it's very informational, like uh, Michael Houghton's one, it's quite informational. It's a lot to take in, you know, it's stuff that you can actually practically do. Um, I think 20 minutes of that 
is, is enough. How you can digest, exactly, yeah. And you can actually action it. Whereas suppose you can get lost in a two-hour Joe Rogan chat with, you know, some astrologist or something, you know? Yeah. It's uh, a... <laughs> It's 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 sort of the I like I really like the the jam packedness of the of the shows and like like I said there's there's four people and there's you've thought out the balance and everything like that um and uh, one one thing that you mentioned earlier on that I found as well me and Mark have talked to loads and loads of people on the Shark Pod uh, this year uh, and you mentioned that you know there's there's something a little bit crazy about the the business people that uh, that we talk about not cra- crazy is the wrong word but there's there's something there there where they walk into a situation and most rational people feel like well this can't be done I'm out. I'm going to get a job like this, but they just keep on going. And uh, sometimes it's hard to stop talking to people like that. Cause it's like, I want to see where this is going. Like I want answers, you know? <laughs> I so agree with you. And that is because they are half nuts. You love them because yeah. they're half nuts. Yeah. And you, you, you just say, what is driving you? Yeah. And uh, I love them. I absolutely love them. I gave a talk up in um, Donegal, uh, local enterprise office about or oh, maybe three i mean a day a month years have been messed up in my head now because of covid but it was possibly three years and i was going to chat to them about something else and then i just said no i'm going to talk to them about the misfits and i put up a um a, a poster from a movie called the misfits and i just chatted away to them about an hour about why we're all mad anybody who there's 250,000 smes so this a large number of these misfits of people who choose to do it for themselves, by themselves. And one of the things that I learned after stockbroking, I was a director of that company, so I was kind of running my own life a little bit. I then took time off and I ended up in a uh, PR company where I was the director of the um, uh, business or what you call a commercial side of PR there. And after a period, I had a very good boss, a very nice um, setup there, and we did, um, we were very successful. But eventually, something niggled at me, and it took me some years to realize that I really wanted to be my own boss. I, and I'm sure you guys are exactly the same, you know best of what you want to do. So when anybody with the best will in the world was telling me to do it another way, just rankled. And it wasn't that I was awkward. I just always felt I wanted to do it my way. And that's when I set up my original company, which is or, uh, uh, is still the media group. And that's the all of my other operations fall under the media group. And that's where we had a newspaper. We were about to, uh, just before the financial crash in 2008, we were about to launch a um, senior magazine. We had made um, TV programs. We had a load of things. But the financial crash put an end to most of those dreams, as has happened to many others. So then we reinvented ourselves back into the PR end of things. And then out of that, podcasting is the, is the new new thing in my life and a, a wild journey it seems like of uh, a lot of it seems like it, your, your life's been project based that's what it seems like it's like okay i'm gonna try this now i was a stockbroker for a while i uh, like you said before the, the the podcast that you're uh, you know setting up quail skulls as well it doesn't it doesn't seem all connected but i guess in the end it all comes together um so the, at this stage on the podcast we usually have this lightning round where mark kind of steps in and, and 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 sees if we can pick your brain on a few on a few items here um just to finish with the podcast uh and it gives I'm us getting worried little- now <laughs> ah, they're nice and easy. Don't worry. <laughs> this is good. It's okay. not grilling that I, I've uh, pitched out there. Okay, simple questions, but you know you can you can elaborate on your, on your answers if you like. So, what apps do you use the most on your phone? Twitter, 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 Twitter. And uh, oh, I have a nice one for anybody. I live down in Sandymount beside the sea, and I have a dog, and the dog has to go walked every day. So I have one called My Tide or Tide In or Tide Cloud or Tide something like that. Local t- local tide, and that tells me when the tide is in or out, and that determines when uh, my lovely little um, white um, uh, Westy goes for her walk. A good deal. What else do I use? Um, Tune in radio sometimes, obviously Spotify to make sure that that great business show is listened to. But Twitter, I live on. I, uh, yeah, that'd be the go to every morning, every evening, and every minute during the day. 
Okay. Well, that answers my, my next question. What's your favorite social media? But um, what's the best business idea you've never acted upon? And you probably have a list of these. <laughs> oh, there's one which is burning the head off me. It's a podcast idea. It will happen. But you know, I have so many. I mean, you now realize that I do a lot of things. And I need, there's one specific one that needs a sponsor. And that is, it's such a strong idea. And it's for the world. Nobody else is doing it. I know it's very kind of, I'm not telling you anything because I can't, but that is burning me up. Uh, any other idea? Um, I, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I know that if I had got the national radio license that I would have given RTE on for its money back in the day. So that always cheesed me off that we, we didn't get that license. And as you, for those people who don't know the history there, that particular people who won the license, there was a um, funny business went on and a government minister resigned and stuff like that. And then the actual radio station failed. So it doesn't give me any pleasure that it failed. It gives me a lot of displeasure that a company like ours, which was above board, didn't get it. So maybe but I don't dwell on, dwell on these things much. Grr. <laughs> so you're not giving away too much about your best idea we'll have to wait for that just yeah. out of interest what what, what kind of if you get who me, would be a sponsor, a sponsor I'll have it tomorrow, I mean, have it tomorrow. And who, what type of company would would a, would a sponsor be generally for something like that out of interest? For the, for the one i'm looking for somebody uh, who wants to get a world audience of people who are i, I think a drinks company i had on the radio show a woman called media not the radio show the podcast mary sadler cool swan for those of you who don't know about cool swan it is a liqueur cream liqueur made in Meath by mary sadler yeah, uh, cool, I heard that one. and she has just won now imagine this an irish small irish company the world's best cream liqueur Bailey's never got that accolade. And Bailey sells a zillion billion bottles. This woman has her own moo cows. They pitch up the cream. The cream goes into the liqueur, uh, Irish whiskey, sold around the world. And I love her. And her brand and her drink would be the ideal one um, for this particular podcast. I have discussed it with her. Something may come of it, but somebody like that who has a brand that they want to bring worldwide that would have a feminine or a female bias would be okay. ideal. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, you already told us this one, but this is a question that we ask. What time do you get up at in the morning and what time do you go to sleep? Well, you start work at, at six and you finish at 11 p.m. So... <laughs> Yeah, and even watching, uh, I, like I sit in bed and I do all my social media, read the Irish Times, straight down onto uh, Outlook, you were asking me about the apps, Outlook, um, uh, Gmail, I think, maybe this is ordinary, I think I have 68,000 emails in my Gmail, I, have, I mean, I just use it for everything, and a vast amount of information that comes in, and then I then disseminate that out. I'd have interest in various areas. Wind energy would be a big area. Oil drilling, a big area. Um, oh, there are so many things that I've had an interest in. Uh, that And people that I would look after who have an interest in those areas that I kind of keep abreast of things. So, I mean, obviously, you, so you don't, you don't sleep much. I kind of, I know it's sad, but kind of I always feel like it's a waste of time of course it's I'm, sleep. <laughs> I'm the same I'm the same. finally somebody who agrees with me I know yeah. it's wrong but okay here, here here's one um if you could do business anywhere in the world where where would it be oh I love this and I'll tell you what I'd love to do obviously I love my little country but I love so much sunshine and I love Portugal and I would love if I had enough money to sit in a um Little, uh, not a little, we're not a big, if you're going to dream, you may as well dream big. A lovely house overlooking the ocean uh, in Portugal, 
but with easy flights home again. But you can, I mean, we can podcast from anywhere in the world. So that is a real possibility. I had a, a, an accountant once tell me of a lovely idea that if you are an accountant and if you're ACCA qualified, and I'm sure, Mark, you know all about this, you can practice anywhere in the world. Uh, similarly, an Irish accountancy firm can hire people in Portugal with an ACCA qualification because they are to that standard. They are the same standard as an Irish ACCA. And therefore, you can have a, a subsidiary office down in Portugal and you could go down there and justify three, four, five, six months a year in Portugal. And I love the Portuguese. They're just gentle people and uh, gorgeous sunshine, nice food. What's not to like? Really? I think that's a great idea. I, I love that type of, uh, like we talked about before, the hope the trackpads about lifestyle design as well and all those types of things. We're just thinking outside the box. How can I work this out so I can get more sunshine and you know be on the beach in Portugal, but also get everything else that I want? You know? <laughs> um, so that's really good. Hey, Mark, one more question before we let uh, Conal go back to his evening here. What do you think? Okay, right. Two, two more, right? Yeah. Is it, is it who you know or is it what you know? Ooh, I like this one. I think it's both. I'd love to give you a straight answer, say, or one or two, because when you need to, oh, here's a nice answer for you. When you need to know something, you need to know who to ask. How about that wow. one now? <laughs> There's a guy, for example, called Antoine Xavier. Antoine is an old, old pal of mine. Antoine, Antoine is Malaysian. He came to Ireland when he was 18, and he had sweet and nothing uh, when he landed here, just a dream. And he builds up that huge accountancy firm, BDO Simpson Xavier, now just known as BDO. When I met Antoine, first of all, the, um, there, there were two of them in the office, uh, uh, Antoine and Dave Simpson. And um, when, I, when, he, when Antoine retired, he had 450 people working with him. And if you want really deep, sensible, grounded business advice, give Antoine a buzz because he just, he's been there, he's done it. And funnily enough, I gave him a shout out on the podcast the other day because he gave me some fantastic sound advice about the future of what I'm trying to, to build. So there's an example of, I didn't know, he knew, so uh, mm. my good mentors and everybody in business swears by a mentor um they're they're invaluable because they normally have your best interests at heart and yet they don't want anything so i love my mentors very good okay next last one if you could advise somebody to learn one skill what would it be compassion don't like quick. people who can, i don't like people who don't have empathy or compassion it's can you learn that I think you can. And if you can't go and um, get, uh, what do you call it, um, go to an analyst and uh, you can know you can, you know, like anything in life you can learn. But compassion, just be nice to people because my Jesus, every time, too often in, and I know that's, that's unfair. Sometimes I've come across uh, and the many, 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 many years I've spent interviewing business people, you'll find one stupid, unpleasant guy. And I just say to myself, you don't have to be like that. 99% of people in business are lovely and they're fun. They may try to scam you or something like that, but they're fun and they're uh, nice. Some of them just think that they have to be desperately hard, desperately just too macho for me. You don't have to. One of the nicest guys, one of the most successful guys that I came across in, um, in my interviews is Tony Smurfett. Tony Smurfett, from what I could find out, and I had a very nice interview with him, has no side to him. He works really hard. He's very successful. And he's not a gobshite. He's a really nice, gentle gentleman. So prove you don't have to be unpleasant and the cop shade and you know hire them and fire them and all that kind of stuff so compassion be human 
the very human. Good. That might be the, the, the title of this. I don't know. We haven't settled on it yet. Uh, Con- Conal O'Moran, thanks very much for joining us today on the on the podcast. Um, it's really, really interesting. I'd love to, because we're just, I guess we're starting out, Mark, in our, in our media uh, career here with the Shark Pod. So uh, to have a real pro on uh, has, been, uh, has yeah. been great for us. But before we go, I have to say that, that Conal was the MC at, at Darwin Hawkins launch event when we had uh, James Khan over. Oh, really? Um, and he did an excellent job. And everybody said, like, that was it was an excellent job so uh, it was really really kind of interesting to see how how you uh you know ask people different questions and the way you did it a true a true professional oh, thank you so much yeah. <laughs> you can invite you back anytime at all <laughs> <laughs>